Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being back this evening, and we are pleased to see you and to share with you today. <clears throat> Thanks, Craig, for noting the uh, subject of the hour and our lesson and singing songs that are apropos in every way to the thing that we are discussing as we announce that tonight. We talk about some things that the cross reveals, some things that become evident, that become clear whenever we think about the cross and the significance of it. This morning we were talking about the last week in the earthly life of Jesus Christ and that as he began that uh, first day of the week, he began it on a victorious uh, way, so to speak, and that he was being honored and glorified and people were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna as he rode into the city unimpressively on a donkey, a colt of a donkey. And yet, here's that scene. The victorious and gloriously honored Savior will by the end of the week be hearing perhaps some of the same people who are in the crowd that day who are saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, may be among the ones in Pilate's court who before the weekend said, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, and have stood by as he ordered, he is ordered to be taken out and to be crucified on the cross of Golgotha. When we think of the cross, what, what do you think of? Just the word cross or the cross, what comes to mind? is the pretty thing. In some cases, I think it probably is. Because the cross represents so many different things to different people. If you could look into the minds of some people, you would think that the cross represents Christianity. You've seen that many times, have you not? It just stands as the symbol for Christianity. Quite often when people want to symbolize that I'm a Christian, they will wear clothing that has a cross on it or perhaps a piece of jewelry that is in the form of a cross. In the Catholic Church, whenever prayer is made, the cross is formed by symbolism in the hands, and the cross represents that aspect of connection with God through the cross. Other people defy the cross. They draw it in ugly ways and they abuse it. There are those who uh, wear it as facial, uh, not sure what the word to use, is they, they, uh, they hang things on their face and sometimes one of them is, might come out of the upper cheek here and it may be a cross that's dangling and being hung there like an earring would be or even earrings that are crosses. And sometimes it looks pleasant and sometimes it is reassuring and other times we say that's inappropriate. I've seen people, heard people say that it's inappropriate for a Christian to wear a cross because they think that that symbolizes Catholicism and they don't want to do anything that looks like they are embracing or supporting Catholicism. But of course, the cross is, in fact, very important in the Catholic Church and the symbolism that's involved there. I'm not sure whether they would say that it's emblematic of themselves. I think that they would like to believe that it's emblematic of the Savior and the price that he paid for us. Tonight, I want to suggest to you that the cross on which Jesus was in fact crucified was not pretty at all. There's just nothing about that on the surface that was pretty. Here was a good man, an innocent man, the only innocent man that ever lived, who is being forced to carry this weighty cross out to the place where it'll be placed. Some people say that it was a two sections of wood that had been put together like we often see, perhaps bolted or nailed at the proper place and was taken and was dropped into a hole. Perhaps after 
the person had been nailed to it, suspended then and dropped into it so that the force of the weight of his body would jerk down on the nails. Others have said the cross in many cases was not like the one that Jesus would have carried, but that there might have been, even at Golgotha, there might have been a stump of a tree. And I don't mean one that's down cut at this level, but just an old tree that had seen better days and died. And there might be two outstretched limbs that were haggard and left there on one, the trunk, at about the right height, and that Jesus might have just been crucified on the stump of an ugly tree. I know the scene was ugly. The people would have been behaving in an ugly way. But this was not the only crucifixion that had occurred. They took him to the, quote, place of the skull, which is what Golgotha means. There is a place on the side of that hill today that looks like a skull. I don't know that somebody didn't place it there sometime with some des designing intent, but I know I can look at it and say that does look like the eyes and the nose and the mouth opening that that would be in a skull. But people were taken there and crucified regularly and their blood would pour out on the ground and Jesus wasn't crucified in a pretty place, but a smelly, gory, fly-infested, stinky place of death. It's hard to make that pretty. And yet there's some things that that in itself reveals whenever we really look at the significance of what the cross makes plain to us. It's emblematic of a death that we would have died, emblematic of the fact that sin leads to death and we all are sinners and we would be condemned, damned for eternity into hell, except for that ugly scene. And the pure and perfect Savior went there voluntarily, as we said this morning from John 10, the verse 17 and 18, he said, no one takes my life from it. I give it up voluntarily. I surrender my life. We sing, I surrender all. I surrender all. And Jesus was doing that when he voluntarily went to the cross. He could have called for the more than 12 legions of angels indeed, but he didn't. And he went there to die for one purpose, just to die but not for his reasons, but for ours. Not for his sin, but for ours. Not because he deserved it, but because we did. And so when you look at the cross, I want to suggest tonight, without using a lot of passages of Scripture, that there are so many absurdities in what the cross reveals. Be patient with me as I declare these absurdities because they require some introspection, some contemplation, some consideration to appreciate them being expressed like this. I heard, though I was not present to see it, that on one occasion a man in a large Texas city preaching in a congregation on Easter Sunday said that the cross was the biggest joke ever played on Satan. And the elders of the congregation were led to release him from his relationship with the church because they thought that he'd made lightly of the cross and that it was no joke whatsoever. And him implying that it was, they took wrong, I think, but I've never preached that sermon or said that for fear somebody might take it the same way. So I say, listen closely to the, to the connections in all of this. I found a very interesting parallelism in a sense this week in that uh, in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 14, 
The Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Galatia, is at that point as he's introducing himself in terms of his former life. In, in chapter 1 and verse 14, he's talking about how he was rising, just, just was soaring into the attention of the people of the Jewish faith, and how he had gone far beyond many of his colleagues who were of his own age and would have been expected perhaps to have gone beyond the ranks that he had ranked. That's in chapter 1, verse 14. When you get to chapter 6 and verse 14, Paul says that it would be inappropriate for him to rejoice in anything, to be glorified in any way other than in the cross of Jesus Christ. If I have any reputation, if I have anything that's outstanding, if I have anything, Paul is saying, that's worthy of note, all those other things that I mentioned, we'll say in chapter 1, though he would not have known it as chapters, but all those things I talked about before are nothing. And if there's anything that I would want you to, to say that's good and grand and deserves glory about me, understand that except for Jesus and his cross, I'd have none of it. I'd be nothing without him. And he indicates that that would be true of us all. When he submitted himself to that cross, things changed abruptly in the scene of the world. And though we weren't born, not conceived, not uh, <laughs> imagined on this earth at the point in time where that happened, it changed everything for us. Let me suggest that the cross is the greatest paradox that has ever occurred in the human life, in the history of mankind. It's the most tragic event that led to the most wonderful events. So sad that unfair, violent, fatal thing happened to Jesus. And yet, for our sake, it is the most wonderful event that ever occurred because it gave us the opportunity of salvation. It is the saddest incident while at the same time, the most joyful event that has ever occurred. It was Satan's greatest victory, and yet at the same time, it was Jesus' greatest humiliation that became the most stunning defeat that Satan ever suffered and is the most glorious victory that ever was accomplished in the whole world ever by anyone, our Savior, Jesus. Jesus, you see, conquered by surrendering. That couldn't have happened, except, as he said, thy will be done and not mine. As he gave in to the will of God and the power of Satan was allowed to extend itself and bring that cruel death on the cross, yet to us the victory that victory that caused Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 to say, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? It has no victory because it lost that battle when Jesus surrendered. It lost all rights to our souls when Jesus gave his life. It is the greatest exhibition of divine judgment and condemnation of sin at the same time that ever existed. It became the greatest and most wonderful demonstration of both the mercy and of God and his pardon. You talk about mercy and grace. How many ways can you describe it? And how many ways can you appreciate it? How deeply can you appreciate it? How wonderfully can you describe it? How many times can you thank God for mercy and grace and for him pardoning us of our sins? Not because we are worthy, 
Not because we've done such penance, not because we've done anything that in any way replaces our repairs, but because Jesus Christ was, as John put it in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, he was the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. The old, ugly, rugged cross showed, revealed the mercy and pardon of God like no one had ever seen it. The Hebrew writer says in 10.4, it was impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. But now, thanks to the spirit of Jesus and the awesome ugliness of the cross, was available to all mankind. And we are among those who've been recipients and have the knowledge of it. God's greatest demonstration of his hatred for sin became the supreme proof of his love for the sinners. He hated sin so much that he would allow his son to die in order for it to be washed away. He demonstrated his love so deeply, so kindly, so reverently, so quietly. He let it happen. My God, my God, Jesus said, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus would perhaps know then or understand later but the important thing is that we would come to understand that this is the supreme proof of the love of God for those of us who are sinners. And the wages of sin is death. We all being sinners deserve to die. But the cross revealed the mercy and pardon, the love and grace of God that demanded justice for sin and would let Jesus step in and take our place. The cross so revealing. The darkest hour in the history of all time was the greatest light. As the light dawned upon a time, the first time, when salvation would now be available, no wonder Jesus had said, I am the light of the world. No one comes to the Father but by me. So bright, so much light, so changing, so iridescently spectacular that the sun, the sun in the sky refused to shine. And it was dark for a period of about three hours in Jerusalem to say the light, the light that will be the light of the world has surrendered itself. And the sun says, I will surrender myself to signify that this is the changing pivotal point in all of history. This is my statement, the son said. My statement is to grow utterly quiet and dark so that his radiance will be available to take my place in the whole world. The face of God turned from Jesus just long enough to let that all occur and the eyes of men look upon him for the hate of the sin of men to be washed out as the blood of Jesus ebbed from his veins and then as he was stabbed in the side and the blood and water sprang forth. Vengeance cried for blood. For without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. And vengeance said, somebody has to die. Blood has to pour. The only blood that was worthy 
was that in the blood of the veins of Jesus, the only sacrifice that was perfect was the Son of God. And so he had to bleed to put his stamp of approval on the whole scene and on the hearts and souls of the people who were complicit that day. Jesus was heard from the cross to say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. It is immediately implied that they don't know that they are killing the Son of God. They don't understand. But on a deeper level, it implied too, they don't understand the greatness of the moment. They don't know that the part they're playing is necessary. They don't know what lies beyond the hope, the grace, the mercy, the church, the fellowship, the brotherhood, the hope, and then heaven, they don't have a clue, Father, what they are initiating. The cross will change the world. And like a key in the earth that would have to be moved slowly, crunch, 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 until the lock could be unjammed, the cross turned the world around and made all the difference, not just in the world, but in heaven and eternity. For us and for all who will look to the cross and take their glory in the cross, will lift it up, will bear their own burdens for the sake of the cross of Jesus Christ. Men's sinfulness came to direct odds with the holiness of God that day. And the holiness of God would prevail to make it possible for us this day to be able to say that by the blood of Jesus, through what he suffered on the cross, man's inability to overcome sin was accomplished not by himself or through his own doing, by the merciful gift of Jesus on the cross. It is this foolishness of what we preach that Paul said is revealed by the cross. And it is by that that men become saved. Oh yes, look at the cross with awe and wonder, with respect, with reverence, and hold it in honor. And thank God. Thank God that he was willing to let Jesus die. And Jesus, that he was willing to pay the price. If you're not saved, you can be. If you're not a child of God, you can be. You may say, how? In a word, the cross. Your response to the cross, to say, yes, I believe that. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Yes, I do repent of my sins. I want to be buried with him in baptism. I want to rely on the grace of God for my salvation through obedience to him. I want to join him in heaven someday. Lord, come quickly. Let it be now. Now. But we must be ready. And if the cross has all occurred as it did, and the provisions all are made as they are, but you, or if I, should refuse to accept the cross and respond appropriately in obedience to the Lord, of all the waste that there's ever been in the world, 
There would be no greater, no greater than for you to miss the advantage that the cross reveals. If you're subject to the invitation of Jesus tonight, by the power of the cross, we invite that you come now. Let us help you go to heaven. Come while we stand and sing.